Ahoy there! Welcome to Cinema Tech Tips. This is the type of video that I would typically post on my other channel, but I figure, hey, it's tech related, and y'all will probably be interested, so I'm going to post it over here instead. I've noticed a strange trend in computing, in which every 10 years, a new paradigm will take over the industry and essentially determine what computing looks like going forward. And it's pretty consistently uh, delineated into 10-year periods. Let me explain. The very first IBM PC came out in 1981 and took offices completely by surprise, changing the way that entire departments operate. People forget that back in the day before office suites, you would have dedicated employees setting up slides for presentation and having to manually work through spreadsheets by hand. When office suites became mainstream, they were able to eliminate many, many, many positions. And all of a sudden, offices just exploded in productivity. In all honesty, most computers you'd see in offices during this time period don't really resemble what we would think of as desktop computers, even if they superficially look the same. Most home users did not know how to use an MS-DOS prompt, unless they were very, very, very nerdy, you see. Now, with the advent of the 90s, this was the time people tended to buy their first personal computer for the home. And a big driver behind this was the paradigm shift away from personal computers simply being the main thing and CD-ROM multimedia being the new paradigm. All of a sudden, for a computer to sell, it had to be graphical, very graphical. It had to have sound, it had to have music, it had to have graphics, 3D graphics. And this necessitated a jump forward in the specs required out of an average computer. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of these throw way backwards into offices. Even though an office back in the 80s did not need, obviously didn't need it, they didn't have it, it didn't need a mouse in order for people to get off the ground running. By the 90s, everyone was using Windows 95 or Windows NT, which had a Windows 95-like interface. Now you ask, if this is a trend, what exactly was the big push in the 2000s? Well, that would be the internet. The internet took the world by storm, and with the introduction of Wi-Fi in the early 2000s, all of a sudden, you could be connected to everyone in the entire world from a laptop at a coffee shop. Now, we started to see more and more web applications as the 2000s went on, and JavaScript being downloaded, compiled, and executed in real time required beefier and beefier computers. This is still a problem we deal with to this day, uh, in which websites are consistently consuming significantly more RAM and CPU than if they were written natively. Now, this required a big paradigm shift. I mean, netbooks, for example, were an entire device category that didn't really have a need to exist before the 2000s. And as we're going to get into, it didn't really have a need to exist afterwards either. Regardless, you can already start to see a trend in which a new purpose for computing is released and it completely changes the way people interact with their devices and therefore changes how these devices are manufactured. I think the biggest step forward in a lot of ways was the smartphone revolution of the 2010s. Now, the smartphones, a lot of companies were really concerned they were going to make computers entirely obsolete. And to some degree, this is actually correct. Gen Z is quite famously much more tech illiterate than uh, millennials ever were. And Gen Alpha is even worse on this front. A lot of this is just because, you know, as the internet made CD-based encyclopedias of the 90s like Encarta obsolete, smartphones for many tasks, not every task, but many tasks make computers obsolete. So where does machine learning fit into all of this? Well, now that we've produced graphics cards that are powerful enough to be able to do the inference required for real-time AI, it's possible for the masses to get their hands on this stuff and use it on a daily basis. Now, regardless on how often people actually use ChatGPT, it is the next big driving force uh, from hardware manufacturers. And you can see this in all the crazy marketing stunts they've been doing, like introducing a Microsoft Copilot button onto the keyboard for whatever reason. Regardless, a lot of people are convinced this is the next step forward and it's going to make smartphones obsolete. Now, they have a few good reasons for thinking this, and perhaps they will be proven correct. I don't know. Because the truth is, if the technology actually works like they claim it does, or they're trying to make it work, then it does make the purpose of a smartphone obsolete. 
because what is the ultimate purpose of the smartphone, or at least traditional apps? First and foremost, it's communication. Maybe not between you and another person, but definitely between you and the pizza delivery place, or the bank, or even for things like writing papers. It's you communicating with the word processor, right? Well, in theory, and I feel like back in the 1960s in sci-fi films, they could see this ahead of time, if you can just tell something to work for you and do a particular task, then you don't need to be looking at it. Will we ever get there? I don't know. But that seems to be the main premise behind a lot of this pushing. However, there's a second thing that I think is a little bit more inherent to how computers actually operate. At its base level, computer is a Turing machine. Basically what it does is it takes the analog world with all of its complexity and it simplifies, it, it quantizes it down into a set of numbers and values um, that can then be shifted around, uh, problems can be solved, and then it converts it back into analog. We communicate with these machines using keywords and mice because they are capable of taking a complex data and reducing it down to a set of buttons or a set of coordinates. Uh, and then once the computer is done, it returns to us what it's thinking on a monitor or through speakers, uh, which are essentially designed to take uh, these uh, quantized data points and turn them into something that, you know, our, our fleshy organs can interact with. And so what's interesting about a computer is that we are essentially expecting that it enhance our analog lives in some kind of quantifiable way. Now, what's interesting about this is that Machine learning is the closest thing we can likely get to a computer being able to properly understand the analog world. And part of that is because we don't understand how these models work. What was the first big step away from using computers in an office space and then bringing them into the home? Well, we needed computers that could produce more colors. We needed computers that could put more pixels on the screen. Computers that could create uh, very lush sound effects and music. We needed computers that felt more like the real world, obviously. And then the next step after that was the internet. We needed computers that allowed us to communicate with other real people. And when real people talk to each other, that's not something that a computer has been able to until very recently simulate. Um, but even then, uh, what you're doing is you're essentially using the computer as a filter in front of analog people. It feels more real. Uh, on top of that, when you introduce smartphones into the mix, now all of a sudden we've got a device in our pocket that we can use to augment the world around us as we're on the go. We're not stuck in a living room or a kitchen. Uh, we can now be on the bus. We can now our car. We can be at work or where, you know wherever we're we're at uh, with this little device in our pocket that has a camera and a microphone and a brilliant high-resolution display. All of these things are meant to augment reality. And so what the next logical step from that would have always been is some sort of tool that's really, really, really good at making this silicon device seem more analog. And ultimately, for what it's worth, AI is the next step in that field. Now, obviously, there's an ethical question to be asked about all of this. And I think that that's an incredibly important thing to discuss. Uh, much in the same way that back in the 1980s, introducing presentation software laid off lots of people. It was a big deal. Or, for example, the epidemic of social media addiction with the advent of the smartphone. I know a lot of people have talked about that endlessly. There are, there are pros and cons, and sometimes very serious cons, to all of these big steps. The core facet being that computers are reality simulators. That is what they do. They take reality, they filter it, and they give it back to you. And what AI does is it allows us to more powerfully take care of filtering reality. I mean, heck, look at AI images. Uh, we can now produce images that, for a lot of people, look very, very, very convincing and help formulate their brain's concept of what reality is. And that's that can be kind of harrowing in the 2030s. Perhaps it'll be augmentation in our brains where we'll have neural links or whatever directly impacting how we see reality. Make of that what you will. Happy Wednesday, everybody. If you like content like this, I'm not sure if I want to keep doing this, but 
I thought it was an interesting concept. And genuinely, I really do want to hear what y'all think. Please leave a comment down below. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. And I hope to see all of y'all at some point in the future. Take care.